All right, let's turn our attention to rugby. Keith Wood is on the line. Good morning, Keith. Uh, morning, Nathan. How are you? I'm OK. So ordinarily, a couple of days out from the start of the Champions Cup, that would be the focus of this conversation. But really, the main talking point in rugby this week has been around, once again, concussion and this story that a group of eight former internationals are planning legal action against World Rugby and the various rugby unions for negligence around brain injuries they suffered during their career. No Irish players right now involved in the initial class action that's been put together in London by a lawyer called Richard Boardman, but it's understood his law firm have written to up to 70 former Irish internationals. He is representing this initial group and says that he believes up to 50% of former professional rugby players could end up with neurological complications in retirement, says immediate changes need to be made to the game to protect the current generation and future players. And I guess to really ram it home, a lot of people will have read the interview earlier this week with Steve Thompson, who was a part of England's 2003 World Cup winning squad, only 42, revealed he has no memory of participating at that tournament, diagnosed with early onset dementia. It's all pretty frightening, Keith. Uh, it's terrifying, actually. And um, the Steve Thompson interview on the, t on the television and Alex Popham um, listening to them talk, listening to their wives talk at the degradation over a period of time is 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 unbelievably frightening, actually. And uh, it's funny because you think that this would be part and parcel of conversations over a last a long period of time. Um, and uh, of course, we've always had a worry about concussion. But uh, I didn't know about either of these cases or any of the other ones until I read the newspaper two or three days ago as well. And it's. Um, and that's not with my head in the sand. Mm. I just didn't, hadn't come across the guys. It wasn't something that was part of, of my peer group. Um, and I, look, I find it really, really frightening to, to, to look at it. And I think some of the reaction afterwards is alarmist. And maybe it should be alarmist. And maybe that that is the appropriate response at this stage. And uh, I do think a lot of changes have happened. I do think there's an awful lot more have to happen. Uh, and I do think you have to end up looking at this in a very different way. And um, so do you look at it entirely different from um, from a kid's or amateur net, um, uh, system to a professional system? And should there be entirely different setups for it? Because it, it's, it is quite literally frightening. And there's, there's the, you can't kind of gloss over this in any way, shape or form. So you weren't one of the Irish players, former Irish players that Richard Boardman has been in touch with? No, absolutely not. And um, I, for me, I had uh, I definitely had concussions in my career. I had three that I knew that I know about, if that makes sense. And the in, the definition of concussion mm. was well, the definition may have been the same, but the definition within the sport for us was maybe slightly different. Um, I was also very fortunate, I think, to play at a particular time where uh, we had. We had pretty strong doctors. Uh, Mick Malloy was our doctor with the IRFU. And uh, on one occasion, when, when I did get concussed, we were playing Italy in the mid 90s. And, uh, and my concussions were slightly unusual, too, I think, in that I, it was my vision was affected. Um, uh, I didn't have a pain in the head. I never felt sick afterwards. I didn't get foggy afterwards. Um, I couldn't see the ball properly. So. Uh, I said it to Peter Clossy, who sh shouted at me in no uncertain terms to get the hell off the field. Um, I went off the field, I went in, had a cold shower, and I, I felt perfect immediately. And um, uh, I said, Mick, I, I feel great now, I feel perfect. And he said, yeah, that's fantastic, you're out for three weeks. And I said, no, but I, actually I feel great. And he said, great, fantastic, you're out for three weeks. And that was what it was up until I think 2005, 2006, mm. where um, where concussion was a mandatory. I think it was 22 days out, and um, um, and I think in many respects it seems to be a little bit frightening sometimes when it's down to six or seven days now. And I know there are far more tests in with, within them. We haven't seen the full extent of how those tests work and and do or don't work. So it's. Um, Look, I think it's it's. Uh, I just think it's a disturbing 
um, trying to look at it in this fashion is just very, very disturbing. But when you read that interview then with Steve Thompson and you talk about three concussions during your career, like what he's talking about is frightening, where it almost seemed like it was a daily occurrence at training, that it was just part and parcel of his training sessions, that he gets some sort of a bang and he'd be down and was it people that say he's having a, a bit of a sleep and he'd be up again in a couple of minutes. Uh, have you in any way been going back over your career thinking, well, yes, I know about three, but actually were there things that were happening to my body at the time that I, I didn't fully realise the seriousness of what was happening, that it was just part of the game, it was just a little knock at the time, whereas it seems now maybe that these were more serious than just a little knock. Um, well, I, look, I think it's different for every every person. It's different to how their maybe their genetic makeup is, uh, how they react to to um, elements or not. But we actually don't really know. That's part of the issue with it. Uh, I would have said there were times that I would have had. I think you'd describe them as concussive um, events. Um, they'd be considered concussion now. I think fair mm. enough. Um, but the the story that he had of the constant. Uh, element. I didn't have that at all, and um, and I feel I look. I find myself incredibly fortunate with the fact that that is, and um, I, I just can't get over the. Um, I think there's a huge amount of shock, and I can't get over the amount of sympathy that has to go for the, these players, and something has to be done to sort them out. So there's, uh, like, it's rugby is going to go into a very difficult situation where. Uh, and an understandably difficult situation where they have to come to terms with this properly, just like NFL did um, from 2005 on. Mm. Kate, when you talk about changes that have been made already to the game over the last 10, 15 years, and you also mentioned that more changes need to happen and quickly, what changes would, th would that be? Oh, look, for me, it, it's it's different. I've been I've been talking about what is. I'm not saying I'm talking about this all the time because I haven't. Because you talk about it, then you move on to something else, and maybe this is the time not to move on to something else. And uh, for me, I think as since the game went professional, and that's one of the the trigger points that's uh, highlighted the maybe the change in the damage that's been done, but um, that the game has become far more complex, uh, far less space on the field. Um, uh, bigger, stronger, faster, all those things. When you're professional, you can analyze everybody. So that means there's no space. So that's fine for professionals and adults. And it, it may not be fine, as it turns out, because you need to have all the facts there in front of you. Um, and one of the comments that was said was, I knew my body would be broken, but I didn't expect my mind to be. That's a harrowing thought. Um, mm. But for me, I think there could be and should be a change within uh, amateur and schools because uh, it is a fantastic game. And uh, I don't think anybody, uh, I think some people would be worried and would say that they don't want their kids to play. I think the level of risk is an awful lot lower at, um, at children, though, of course, there is a risk and there's a risk in all things. But I do think a lot of the law changes that have happened since the game of professional are, are suitable and appropriate for professional sports people. And may not be for kids. So the lifting in the line out, some of the scrummaging, some of the tackling, maybe the tackle height. You know, I don't think it would affect the game as too badly if you change those to make the game infinite. If you can make the game infinitely safer for kids, I think that's a much better place to be anyway as a standard. So um, I don't know that that would uh, will change how the game is played, and I don't think that will stop people becoming professional sports people afterwards if it's deemed to be fit that they can do so. So they're the sort of changes I'd look at. I mean, when the HIA came in, I have to admit, I would have been in the Barry O'Driscoll camp, which was he didn't like the idea of it because um, the, the laws were that if you had suspected concussion, you were taken off the field, um, but not taken off the field and then assessed off the field. You know, you're taken mm -hmm. off the field and that suspected concussion was considered to be a concussion. So. Um, I, I look. I do think there's a huge amount of work has gone on with it. I still don't know that it's it's there yet. I also know of a couple of uh, diagnostics company that are in the middle of trying to do concussion uh, markers for blood tests, but that wouldn't be instantaneous either. Uh, there is a huge amount and has been a huge amount doing it, but this brings it to very stark relief that these things need to be done far sooner, far far more quickly. The HIAs going to come under major scrutiny now I would expect Jamie Cudmore was on with Joe last night talking about his personal experience and thankfully no long-term damage that he knows of just yet 
But again, he was making the point that you don't need to be knocked out to suffer damage to your head from a collision, and that still the HIA, the return to play protocols, it seems somewhat uh, coincidental that it's six days and that Saturday to Saturday you can be back from one week to the next. Do you expect when a storm like this emerges that World Rugby's response is instant? Do you expect that things are going to change quite dramatically in terms of how the game is played, in terms of how head injuries are treated? Can we expect a change in that quite quickly or is it unfortunately just the way of the world that this could end up in quite a long process and that some of those playing where you'd have to expect the hits are getting heavier all the time, that actually players playing now, it may be too late for some of them. Uh, I actually think some of the changes will be nearly instantaneous because I think they'll have to be. And I looked at the campaigners, uh, they, uh, they had a 15-point idea of things that they wanted to change. So when I looked at that, I said, well, I don't know that some of those things will happen straight away, but I do think that some of them can happen straight away. And so when you have a little look at whether there, there could be a limit to substitutes, and we've talked about that often, mm. Nathan, and the idea of limiting the substitutes is that it is much harder to play for 80 minutes if you're a couple of stone heavier than you are normally. Um, I know that myself. I had one year in 98 where I was a stone heavier. I was 18 stone. And I didn't finish an international. I was shattered at 60, 65 minutes. And ultimately, for the rest of my career after that, I lost that weight. Um, it was great for scrummaging, but not great for lasting 80 minutes. And uh, I was then able to kind of keep going for 80 minutes. So I think you could limit it. You could have seven or eight guys on the bench, but you might only be able to use two or three of them. I, I think that does make a bit of a difference to size. Um, uh, some of the other ones I think that could change better testing in pre-season I think that could be done very very quickly uh, concussion spotters to have the authority to remove players with symptoms I think that is uh, that could happen almost immediately you know there's a lot of those things that could could happen straight away full set of medical tests um, that are done at the start of every season better care after retirement these are things that could be enacted pretty quickly um, some of the others will require study some of the other ones will require lawyers you know and that those ones make things go much slower mm. but look i could see rugby has to has to do the right thing in this instance now i think rugby would say that for a huge amount they have been but the evidence of this points out the fact that there's a lot of people that are suffering quite badly at an early age and that's not something that you want to have afterwards so it isn't ban rugby it isn't stop rugby it is try and make it fully aware of everything that can happen i think you have to make certain that you protect children i think that is something that is essential um and uh, and you have to have all the facts laid out in front of people and i do think rugby has tried to make those changes but uh, maybe it hasn't ha happened fast enough i don't know but for me i'm still in a state of shock for um for these uh, reports to come out over the last few days you touched on the NFL earlier and how they dealt with this. Well, part of it was that they ended up paying close to a billion dollars in compensation. The NHL had a similar scenario. On your State of the Union series, we did a pretty deep dive into the future of rugby and COVID and the financial implications of all of that and the issues that were facing rugby. How worrying for the unions is this development? I guess they must have been expecting it considering the conversations that have been going on in recent years because it does feel as though this is going to only end one way when you see these sort of cases starting to happen. I, look, I'm sure it's going to be worrying for them in a financial perspective, but I think we should put that aside for the time being and worry about it for for the health perspective. And like, I, I'm not saying you cover everybody in cotton wool. I'm not saying that you stop doing absolutely everything, but you make every step you possibly can to make it some way safer and still keep what it is as a game, you know? And I look, I do believe that there's an element of risk in, in everything. And I, as I said, I played at a time, um, and of course there was a bit of macho stuff that you, uh, you can play on, you're fine. But uh, we also had, that strength, that certainty. You know, we talked about certainty the other day just in terms of playing, but the certainty of a medical staff saying, you're concussed, you're out for 22 days. You know, nobody argued, you didn't argue with that, you know? So um, I don't know. I think things have changed all the time. I think there could be big financial ramifications. Um, uh, but for me, I think you need to look at it in terms of what you want the sport to stand for over time. 
and that has to be something that is uh, a safe uh, with a manageable level of risk. I mean, look, there's a saying that exercise is good for your sport, is bad for you. Mm. Well, you do get kind of sm smashed up a fair bit when you play. Um, uh, again, I'd go back to the line that you uh, you expect your body to do it and you accept that f from it. Um, like I, I started trying to think of this with Steve, Steve Thompson the other day. He said if he had his time again, he wouldn't do it. Um, I don't feel like that at the present moment in time, but actually maybe I would if, if I had dementia and mm. if my faculties were beginning to diminish. Maybe that is the case for it. And so if you can mitigate and make changes so that that becomes a far, far smaller risk, I think that's, that's the right thing to do. And just finally, Keith, on the ramifications and the future of the game, you have kids playing the game. In terms of them playing the game, have you any concerns? And also being around underage rugby, have you noticed any sort of drop off because of the awareness of head injuries and stories like this that actually parents simply don't want their kids playing the game? Uh, of course. Well, of course, I, well, I have seen that. And I remember being asked once, uh, I've been involved with um, uh, paralysis in sport for, uh, for a long time. I got involved about 25 or six years ago. And I remember. Uh, a mother saying to me, how can you tell me that my son should absolutely play the game? I said, I don't ever tell you that. I, you have to make your decisions yourself as to what you do. There is risk in everything. I said, what I would say is you make certain that you put your, your kids in a club that have very good coaches that make certain that they do things as well as they possibly can. And you try and mitigate against it as much as you possibly can. Um, for me, that's a reasoned argument, but I don't tell people you have to play. I've three sons who play. Um, that it, Of course, it frightens me a fair bit. They love the game. And uh, whether I want them to be a professional or, or not is a moot point for me because one of them is an adult. The other two uh, are getting very close to being there. They will make their own decisions. For us, it's to try and make certain that they have the best information to hand so that they can make those decisions for themselves. That's the nature of parenting and as much as I can see it but look I love the game um, but I am shocked by what we've seen in this last week. All right thanks a lot Keith we'll talk a lot more about that I'm sure over the coming weeks. Keith Wood you'll be part of our commentary team at the weekend uh, for the Keith Wood Derby as it is Munster against Harlequins in the Champions Cup on Sunday evening we'll also have Rassing against Con